Well, good morning, everyone, on this Sunday after Easter. I am glad that you are here. You know, every day is Resurrection Sunday, isn't it? Because we are an Easter people, and how beautiful it is that you are here. My name is Pastor Dan, and I welcome you to the Metropolitan Community Church, where our mission is to bring people closer to God and one another. And so this service has been designed with you in mind, and I just pray that God will touch you in multiple ways as we have this time together. And before we get started, I just want to remind you that there is a Keeping in Touch card in the seat pocket right in front of you. Feel free to go ahead and pull that out right now and fill it out on both sides, uh, telling us information so that we can let you know what's going on in the church that can help minister, and then you can let us know what's going on in your life. If you have any care needs, it's an opportunity for us to share and to care together. Well, before we continue the worship, I invite Lee Bowman, our office administrator, to give us some announcements. Thanks, Lee. Glad to, Pastor Dan. Um, last Wednesday evening proved once again that we can have fun, share fellowship, and help support our ministries at the Met all at the same time. I want to say a big thank you to everyone who attended Pastor Dan's birthday bash Wednesday evening and to the fundraising team and to everybody who helped to make it a success. Uh, we raised just over a lot, uh, fifteen hundred dollars for a ministry. You did that. You did that. So thank you very much for that. You asked for it, and actually you did. Uh, people have asked us about the annual tax tie challenge that we've done in other years, an opportunity to share a portion of your tax refund with the church. And uh, in a secret back pocket near you, you'll find a green form that uh, details that and gives you an opportunity to sign up for the Tax Tithe Challenge. And uh, we wish all of you generous tax refunds <laughs> from both Washington and Sacramento. <laughs> Coming up next is our uh, gigantic parking lot sale on Saturday, May 6th. Uh, 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, and those tra treasures that you've been collecting and putting aside that are calling for a new home, you can put... No, treasures. Oh. Not trash, treasures. <laughs> we are eagerly awaiting those treasures. You can bring them to church next Sunday between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m. Or contact uh, Ron Sperry of our fundraising team. His contact information is on the back of the bulletin if you need assistance. And also the fundraising team could really use some help on the day of the parking lot sale. Just an hour or two to help out with you. Just a great assist to them. A great opportunity in neighborhood outreach has been added to our church calendar. Pastor Dan and the Met are excited to join with other area churches in an interfaith service on Thursday, May 4th at 6.30 p.m. It's entitled, Do Not Be Afraid. It's hosted by St. Mark's United Methodist Church, which is on Claremont Drive, just up the hill, a couple miles. And uh, also a modest dinner of soup, salad, bread, and fresh fruit will be provided at 5.30 we just ask you to RSVP so that we can let St. Mark's know anticipated numbers, and you'll find that RSVP list on the information table in the social hall. Another date to mark on your calendars is Sunday, June 4th, for our 47th anniversary services. And that evening, <laughs> and that evening at 6 p.m., we welcome back to our platform, to our sanctuary. In concert, the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Choir. Uh, glorious music, glorious voices, just a, a fabulous evening. So add that to your calendar. And while you're marking dates on your calendar, go ahead and mark July 15th and 16th for San Diego LGBT Pride. It's our biggest outreach of the year. It's an opportunity for the Met to be seen and heard and to have one-on-one -on -one contact with people in the community. So plan to march with us in the parade on that Saturday, July 15th. 
We encourage everyone to join in, participate in dining out for life this Thursday evening. We're entering the restaurants um, that are participating have pledged a minimum of 25% of their proceeds to go to the center's HIV and AIDS um, health programs and also preventative services. And in front of the altar this morning, the beautiful floral arrangement that you see there is provided by Mike Franz and Phil Sanchez, soon to be Sanchez Franz, and uh, it's in honor and celebration of their sixth wedding anniversary. So <laughs> I invite you to stop by our bookstore and script center after service uh, to check out the goodies and if for no other reason to wish Fred Island a happy birthday. Yay, happy birthday. <laughs> our Sunday school is not available this morning, but the nursery for our uh, infants uh, is available and uh, you can take uh, advantage of those services right there at our east door, and that concludes our announcements. Thank you, Lee Bowman. I want to just say another plug-in for that interfaith uh, next Thursday, uh, the first Thursday of May. How beautiful it is that we're going to be able to worship, that we were invited to be with the, uh, the fellow churches and the, the, the uh, Islamic temple, the Monsignor, uh, uh, the Catholic uh, Diocese, is going to be speaking also. So what a beautiful interfaith ecumenical service that we can all be a part of. And so I just want you to put that on your calendars. I invite you now to rise as you are able. This is an opportunity for you to greet one another in this first Sunday after Easter greeting. Say so you're looking for it.
pray with me, please? Loving Creator, in this house of peace, we ask you to clear the busyness from our hearts and minds and allow us to enter into your holy presence to be cleansed by your Spirit. Take away the distractions of our week, of our morning, our concerns for the coming week, and allow us to settle into a state where we can feel you beside us, holding us up, embracing each of us, pouring your love into us. We're reminded what a miracle good health is that has allowed us to be here this morning. And we hold up in prayer those struggling with limitations. Show us, God, what stands in the way of obeying you and loving you with all of our being. May our love for you be constant, pure, and focused. And let that love be kept fresh through your word, our worship here this morning, and fellowship with our friends, families, and neighbors. This weekend, we recognize Earth Day and celebrate the grandeur of all that you have made, from the healing waters of creation which bring pleasure, health, purity, and life itself to the richness of the good earth that brings forth flowers, fruits, and vegetables that sustain and please us. We celebrate all the creatures, great and small, that roam the earth, ourselves included, with whom we share this precious web of life. We ask that you guide us to be good stewards of our home, mindful of the fragility interconnectedness of all creation. Help us to be wise in our use of resources. Guide us to live so as to preserve the beauty and goodness of the earth for ourselves and for all generations to come. We give thanks and are reminded that our denomination leaders have articulated our common statement of faith as a prayer. And I quote, Come, taste and see. Jesus Christ, you invite all people to your open table. You make us your people, a beloved community. You restore the joy of our relationship with God, even in the midst of loneliness, despair, and degradation. We are each unique, and we all belong, a priesthood of all believers. Baptized and filled with your Holy Spirit, you empower us to be your healing presence in a hurting world. We expect to see your reign on earth as it is in heaven as we work toward a world where everyone has enough, wars cease, and all creation lives in harmony. We affirm your charge to all of humanity to care for the land, sea, and air. Therefore, we will actively resist systems and structures which are destroying your creation. With all of creation, we worship you, every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. We know you by many names, Triune God, beyond comprehension, revealed to us in Jesus Christ, who invites us to the feast. Lord, we thank you for your abundant, ceaseless, and unconditional love you give us freely, as together we pray aloud those words taught to us by your Son. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Auxiliary Will Car Scripture reading. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walked along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning. And when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels, who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said. They did not see him. Then Jesus said to, him, said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, walked ahead of, as if he was going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning with He was opening the scriptures to us. At the same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found that them and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. This is a message of hope. Praise to you, creator of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Be acceptable in your sight, God, who is our strength and our Redeemer. Amen? Amen? You may be seated. Well, how many of you like to play Trivial Pursuit? I like trivia. In fact, I love, I'm a Jeopardy watcher. I just like watching Jeopardy and just see if I can get some, you know, like, it makes me feel smart if I can get an answer. It's a fun thing to do. And here's a little bit of trivia for you this morning. Now, according to the Journal of Biblical Archaeology, we have our scripture reading today about the road to Emmaus, right? Well, there are at least nine possible locations for the biblical town of Emmaus, according to this biblical archaeology. Historians tell us that they don't know exactly where the village of Emmaus might have been. 
You know, that's a lot of time with a lot of burning and a lot of plundering and a lot of wars and a lot of, you know, people have demolished towns and you know how it goes, it's like the dirt got higher and when they're now digging for towns that are a couple of years old, it's like buried feet underneath the ground. And so people don't know exactly where Emmaus is, but scripture tells us that it might have been a place just a few hours from Jerusalem. That is if you were walking by foot. Not in our cars, just be a couple minutes if we were just driving. But it depends on what time of day here in San Diego, right? <laughs> Rush hour traffic. Three o'clock on Saturday afternoon. You gotta look out for that. <laughs> you never know when you're gonna hit it, right? Now, New Testament theologian Marcus Borg suggests that Emmaus is nowhere. Now, I've never heard this before from a sermon. This is very enlightening to me. He goes on to say, Emmaus is nowhere precisely because Emmaus is everywhere. Emmaus is nowhere because Emmaus is everywhere. And he goes on to say, each and every one of us has traveled along the road to Emmaus. I know I've been on the road to Emmaus. I'm on the road to Emmaus every time I'm searching for answers. Every time that I am doubting, every time that I'm questioning, and I've had many conversations along this path discussing the ifs, the ands, and the buts of my faith, of religion, and of life itself, especially when life brings us stuff. <laughs> and I think of all of us have been on the road to Emmaus at one time or another. It's easy to imagine these two travelers as they're strolling down this road to Emmaus, and we can almost hear them talking, can't we? Maybe they're even arguing about what had happened. They're asking themselves, what are we to make of this? Jesus was supposed to be the Messiah, the one to free the people from oppression and bring them back into relationship with God, and now Jesus was gone. We still got the Roman Empire just kind of standing on our necks and making things difficult. Jesus is gone. We're still being oppressed. And they're wondering, had they been fooled by some cruel hoax? It's not a good feeling, is it? They have trusted Jesus. They believed in Jesus. And they had followed Jesus. And as a result, their lives have been changed. And they've been changed for the better. And then the unspeakable happened. They saw their beloved Jesus shamed and ridiculed and humiliated and then crucified in such a horrible way. And now he was dead. Or was Jesus dead? Because then they started hearing different people who had said that they had seen Jesus alive. Could it be that they really saw Jesus? We can hear these two friends wrestling with each other. And even in their hearts, what is going on, they're wondering. And the story of wrestling, the unanswerable questions, was written at the turn of the century, almost 2,000 years ago. And isn't it amazing how apropos it still is today? That we still go down the journey, we still go down the road, and we are wondering and we're questioning, and it is all right to wonder and to question. And we also hear conflicting reports about death, even death today. And I'm talking about the death of Christianity. Even Time magazine had a front cover saying, is God dead? We wrestle with abuses that we've seen in churches, and unfortunately many people here have personally experienced abuses from a church where you have been hurt by a church. And we wonder about God hearing us when we cry out, when we're going through some difficult times, and we're just asking God, and we're crying in the middle of the day, in the middle of the night, and it feels like it falls on deaf ears, or there's at least a glass ceiling that doesn't get anywhere. And it just comes bouncing back at us. And then there's that growing trend of so many people who are signing up in that category, Call me spiritual, but not religious. So many people that want to go about that. And so we struggle down the road to Emmaus. And we're talking with one another. And we are just waiting for someone to appear to us. 
for someone to open up our eyes and someone to cause our hearts to burn within us and open the scriptures to us. Well, I want to let you know that on this road to Emmaus, we are not alone. There are fellow journeyers and sojourners on this road with us. And so let's look at the many travelers who are on this road to Emmaus. There's a story of a fellow traveler called Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi was a Hindu who studied all the great religions of the world and after completing an exhaustive encounter the divine. So he resolved that he would become a Christian. And then he went to church. And in the church he discovered a great chasm between the teachings of Jesus and the way Jesus' followers actually live. And so Gandhi resolved, still, I am going to become a Christian just as soon as I actually meet one. That is a fellow traveler. As we travel along the road to Emmaus, struggling with one another about what we're to make of all of this, we encounter those who also hold on to their interpretation of Scripture. Their sacred scripture, they hold on so tight, insisting that we believe and believe every word and believe it just like they believe it. I've heard preachers call these folks religious terrorists. They're only too willing to tell us what it all means, because they have all the answers. And they're exactly going to tell us how to interpret the scripture and how it says that we ought to understand exactly everything the way that they understand it. And some people even wave the Bible as a weapon. And they take some scriptures and they clobber people with it. Those clobber scriptures. And they use the Bible to clobber as if it were a weapon and then threaten eternal damnation if you don't believe every single word or pray exactly the prayer that they want. I met people like that. There's another person on the road to Emmaus. Her name is Karen Armstrong. And she's one of the world's authorities on religion who's written several books about all the religions of the world. And she also has a famous TED Talk for her call for a world chartered for compassion. I invite you this week to Google Karen Armstrong TED Talk and listen to that 10-minute talk. It's really quite beautiful. And I learned from her that the word belief originally meant to love or to prize or to hold dear. I like that, to hold dear. And we say we believe in many things, don't we? We repeat things that we believe. I believe in God, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the communion of saints. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. I believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. And these beliefs then become creeds, which comes from the Latin word credo, again, which means I believe. Credo. I believe. And Armstrong tells us that credo did not mean that I accept certain credal arguments of faith. It meant I commit myself to, or I engage myself with. And Karen Armstrong insists that religion is not about believing things. Religion isn't about believing things. Rather, religion is about behavior. Religion is about behaving differently. She says you can really, truly only understand religious doctrines when you can put them into practice. When you can actually put them into practice and practice what you preach and what you hear. And according to Armstrong, in every single one of the world's major things, <laughs> Compassion is part of it. Compassion. That means the ability to feel with the other. Compassion. Compassion with. Compassion. 
feeling with the other. And it's not only a test of true religiosity, it's also what will bring us into the presence of what the Jews and Christians and the Muslims call God or the divine. It's compassion, says the Buddha, that brings you into nirvana. Why? Because in compassion, when we feel with the other, we dethrone ourselves from the center of the world and we put another person there. In other words, we're going to take ourselves out from the middle and the universe revolving around us and we're going to put somebody else there and it'll revolve around them and we're going to get our eyes totally off of ourselves. And once we get rid of ego, then we're ready to see the divine. And I like an acronym for ego that I heard once, ego, edging God out. You've heard that before. Ego. When we start looking at this and we want to put ourselves there, then God gets diminished. And when we can get ourselves out of the way, God is lifted up because then that helps us be able to be compassionate. And she also points out that every single one of the major world's religions has highlighted or put at the center of its teachings what has become known as the golden rule. You know the golden rule. How Jesus talked about doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. And then Jesus goes on to talk about the greatest commandment, which is love God with all of your heart. That's it. Or does it go on? Oh, it goes on. Love God with all of your heart, and then also love your neighbor. That's good. And it goes on, doesn't it? That's not the end of the story. Love God with all of your heart and love your neighbor as you love yourself. It's that ability to love ourselves, to love our neighbor, and love God all together. Well, there's another traveler on the road to Emmaus, and that's St. Augustine, or also some people say St. Augustine, who said... Scripture teaches nothing but charity. You know what charity means? Charity means love. Scripture teaches nothing but love. And we must not leave any interpretation of Scripture until that we have found a compassionate interpretation of it. So when someone is giving you an interpretation of Scripture, let's look for the compassionate interpretation of Scripture. I think that is so beautiful. I mean, isn't that beautiful that we can struggle to find compassion in Scripture? I think it's a good practice. And I think it's a good practice for helping us in our everyday living also. When we are struggling to find compassion in all that we say and how we respond and how we're talking. Unfortunately, many religious people, and I say that in quotes, have become more concerned with being right than behaving with compassion. <clears throat> We've seen that before. We've experienced that before. And sometimes when I see that happening in the church, in the Christian church, where they want to be right more than they practice compassion, it's like, i got to just say, well, um, you know, I'm a Christian, but my belief isn't like that. This is how I believe, and I want to behave this way, right? It's about behaving. And unfortunately, we have this, that people want to be right as opposed to behaving with compassion. And as we travel down this road to Emmaus, may it become less and less important for us to believe in a certain way, and more and more important to behave yes. with compassion. Amen. God's not dead. God is not dead. God is alive. And God is alive and well. And we are not alone on this journey. God walks with us on this journey and on this road to Emmaus. And sometimes when we are in the thick of things, we look down and we only see one set of footprints. We go, God, I knew it. I knew you weren't around. And like that footprint poem says, that's when God was carrying you through the difficult times. And here we want to just put it all about us, that we're all alone. God, you don't hear me. 
toward me on this first Sunday after Easter, I pray that we will be able to resurrect compassion. Oh, you might think it's dead, but it's not. On this Easter, this, this Sunday after Easter, we can resurrect compassion, and it can be in our faith, and it can be a pathway to peace, and I pray also that we will recognize the divine in our neighbor that we will recognize the divine in the other. And you can fill whatever the other is. Someone that doesn't look like you, doesn't talk like you, that doesn't believe like you, all those things, that is the other. And may we also recognize the divine even in our enemies. Hmm. Now that's behaving different, isn't it? I want that kind of religion. When we can have that kind of response. I like how one preacher said it. Believing that God is alive is not the point. But behaving like God is alive is the beginning of compassion. I want to say that one more time. Believing that God is alive is not the point. But behaving like God is alive is the beginning of compassion. And may that be so. The song that I grew up with, and this just came to me as I was preparing this sermon this week. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. I want to reach out, and I want to touch you. And God, I pray that you would open my ears, too. There's so many different voices that are coming that are just kind of speaking in our ears. And God, help me to listen to you. I want to hear. And I pray that if you know the song, join us, and if not, listen, and whatever we do, let's make it our prayer as we seal this sermon. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see. something like, folks, we got a big problem. Uh, we need a new roof. And, and don't worry, 
we don't. But if we did, we came and said, we need a new roof, and it's going to cost $25,000, and we don't have it. I really believe that within about two Sundays, we would have that money. My congregation, you would come through. You come through in the ministry, in supporting activities and the programs, in giving of your time, talent, and treasure. And when you come through, particularly financially, it enables the church to come through in ministry, in programs, and in outreach into the community and fulfilling our mission of bringing people closer to God and one another. And right now, this morning, you have an opportunity to come through once more as the ushers come forward right now to receive our tithes and offerings and keeping in touch cards.
Let us pray. Creator God, thank you for traveling with us on each of our roads to Emmaus. Thank you for repeatedly coming through for us. Continue to guide us in your call for each of our lives. And comfort and strengthen us every day. Amen. If God is with us on the journey, I invite you to join me in the great Thanksgiving as we celebrate Holy Communion. God be with you. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing, both now and always, to give thanks to you, O God, Creator of heaven and earth. And now we join our voices with those angels and the saints who have already gone on before us as together we sing that never-ending song of praise. Song of represents my body given for you. And each time that you eat this, do this in memory of me. Hagan esto en memoria mía. And in like manner, he lifted up the cup, lo levanto. He asked for God's blessing upon it and said, as you drink from this cup, the very life essence that is poured out for you and you and each one of you, Know and remember me, Aganesto, in memoriam mia. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for these gifts, for this bread, the fruit of the earth, and the work of human hands, and for this cup, the fruit of the vine. We ask that you would bless and consecrate these elements, that they would become for us the body and blood of Christ as we each understand that to be. And as we consume these elements, O oh God, I pray that you would bless and set us apart, consecrate our lives too, to continue the work of justice and compassion that Jesus loved. Amen. 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 Here at MCC San Diego and around the world, you don't need to have it all figured out. You don't need to be a member. All are welcome to come and see. So as you follow the directions of the ushers, they'll guide you forward to a server go dip a wafer in grape juice, offer you a brief blessing, receive that holy communion time with God in that moment, 
And as you walk back to your seats, be mindful that there are others also in that Holy Communion time with you. And God just asks for each one of us to come just as you are.
reaction to you being here this Sunday is hallelujah. I'm glad that you are here. I'm glad that you are here. Please not be spiritual as we close with this wonderful song. There's a sweet, sweet spirit.